Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Fotheringham. I'm a practice consulting director working out of our Toronto office. But today, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the Clear Results Energy Forum. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> It's uh, great to see you all in Austin, and for those of us who weren't able to join us in person, a very warm virtual welcome to you. Um, as you can see, we, our theme is connect, and in a moment I'll invite Rich up to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and we, I should note that we are recording all of the except, these sessions with a couple of exceptions, including the round table and the breakout accelerating energy transition for energy concierge, which will be a live exclusive in-person event. So as you know, um, safety is, uh, of both our clients, your customers, our people and our partners, is of paramount importance to everything we do at Clear Results. And I would not be a Canadian if I didn't talk about the weather. So perhaps you have noticed it is warm outside. Um, hopefully you are enjoying your fans that came in your goodie bags. If you haven't had a chance to get some, they're just out in the reception. Uh, but it is really important to uh, watch what you eat, stay hydrated, we've got lots of water here, make sure to monitor the weather and limit the time you spend outdoors. Uh, ensure to watch as well for the signs of illness, including headaches, nausea, dizziness, sweating, not sweating, um, heat exhaustion and heat stroke can be real killers. So please ensure you stay safe. Um, we've got a great team here to help you if you've got any questions. The safety moment has been brought to you by climate change. <laughs> All right, just a few housekeeping notes here before we get started. Um, please silence your phones and personal devices. Uh, we are looking forward to having a really engaging few days here, but if you do need to make a couple calls, we've got some comfy rooms outside. Uh, we also have the Wi-Fi information here, um, and they're also located on the meeting tables in the breakout sessions. Um, please also, if you haven't done so, download the conference app. Uh, you can stay on top of the agenda and pick which breakout sessions you want to attend, much like any music festival. Um, and lastly, our team, as I mentioned in our safety moment, is in the lobby should you have any questions about uh, food, beverage, rooming, or anything else. And if we can just maybe stand up at the back there just to show people who, uh, who to go to for some of the organizing committee. Thank you all. Okay, just to get us a little situated, you are located right now in the Onyx Ballroom. Uh, we will be eating in this room, but food will be served in front of the Topaz, which is behind me. Uh, our suggested emergency exit is in the stairs just across from this room, and in case of emergency, please follow all hotel instructions. Okay, so we've gotten through the housekeeping items. Uh, let's dive into our exciting agenda. Um, this morning, after our keynote speaker, uh, we'll be diving into driving IRA success through collaboration. And then after a short break, uh, we'll have the breakout sessions. So Central and West will be located here in the Onyx Ballroom and Canada and East in the Topaz. Um, if you're not sure how you self-identify, please feel free to see any of the organizing committee and we can direct you. Um, after our networking lunch, we're going to have some topic round tables, including gas utility hot topics and marketing. And then after a short break, uh, we'll close it out with a general session on uh, sustainable diverse partnerships before we shuffle on over to the electric shuffle for some fun this evening. Um, just to note for tomorrow, we'll be starting at 8 a.m. with breakfast again served outside the Topaz. And then we'll have a morning of a, a number of breakout sessions, including investing in program innovation, strategies to broaden partnerships in electric vehicle programs, um, accelerating energy transition with energy concierge, as well as our successful demand response capacity delivery through partnerships. Um, our last breakout session will focus on residential program innovations to support housing, as well as the human side of energy management in decarbonization. And then we'll wrap up the session with our luncheon keynote on uh, transitioning to midstream before hotel checkout at noon. And you're welcome to keep your bags in the lobby belt stand. Alrighty, so I am uh, particularly pleased to introduce our CEO and President Rich McBee to deliver some opening statements. Uh, Rich joined us in 2021, and in addition to doing a great job running the company, I hear he is also a very avid runner. Um, he's run every day for the past five years, including uh, when he had COVID, and this morning where the temperature has approximated those close to the surface of the sun. <laughs> Rich, come to the stage, please. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I am super excited to be here today. Um, we didn't pick uh, July, the hottest part of the month. Uh, this is our last, you know, pre-COVID uh, event that we've had to deal with. So, um, you know, in 2019 was our last 
all-person event. And uh, we had contracted this particular hotel in a cool part of the year. Uh, COVID happens, we've got this big credit, and then all of a sudden, uh, hey, we wanna use it, we wanna bring people back together, we've done our virtual, we've done our regional, and now it's time really to get back to kind of a national view. And the reality is they said, great, we love to host you, July's the time frame. <laughs> And everyone, uh, but, you know, we knew that we got really passionate people and people would show up and we're excited that you're here today. You know, there's a concept called the wisdom of the crowd. And that is when you take topics and you discuss topics amongst a group of people, absolutely the best ideas come out. And the more people that you have collaborated on ideas and challenges and those kind of things, the reality is the better ideas that you get. And then you can select those and you can take action specifically on those ideas. And that is a, really the concept of what we're trying to do today. And it's the, uh, all about the theme of, of Connect. You know, um, I've been here at Clear Result for two years. And it is amazing the transformation that I have seen in the industry. Literally, when I first went out and did customer meetings, um, supply and demand wasn't really an issue. And now I hear all the time that the demand is outstripping the supply. And the fastest way to correct that is alternative energy sources and things are being brought up and brought up fast as they can is energy efficiency. It's the most effective, it's the most cost effective, and it's something that we can do now. So this change that has happened has been incredible over a very short period of time. You know, electrification, you know, climate-related, extreme weather, all these things are happening kind of simultaneously and really having an impact not only on our clients, but also ultimately all of our customers. Uh, they're feeling that pain. And we have the opportunity to really kind of release some of that pain and make lives better. You know, um, we are at an inflection point where there is gonna be more money invested in energy efficiency and climate related activities. And the key is gonna be is how do we use that effectively to really make a difference? The money is gonna be there. The labor, the programs, all those kind of things that have to be pulled together to make this happen in a very, very short window is an ultimate challenge. Is an ultimate challenge for all of these. So there's a sense of urgency and momentum at the same time and we have the real opportunity to take advantage of that to make lives better uh, and also make a real difference for our environment. This is a, a fun year for me because it's the 20th birthday of Clear Result. This is our 20th year as, as a company. And uh, the impact that we've had, I would say, I am incredibly proud of the amount of you know, CO2 averted, the amount of energy saved, the amount of real dollars we've saved on moderate and low income uh, uh, patrons that we have. So this is a very exciting time and it's also a pivotal time for us. So we're very excited, we're all ears. I like to say that we have a lot of experts in our company and we've invited you as experts in your field to come join and to collaborate and to talk. You know, when we think about, like I said, the uh, theme of this is it's, you know, people are really key to solving these energy things. The money is gonna be there. There's no question. The question is, do we ask for it? Do we ask for it for things that are really gonna make a difference? And then how fast can we move to really make that difference? You know, we live in a world where connected devices are becoming a way of life. Everything we have is somehow connected. And the reality is that is what is happening, that connection in daily life is what we're trying to establish here is that connection between the people that are really gonna make a difference. This is a very, I say, labor-intensive industry that we serve, and labor-intensive means people <laughs> at the end of the day. People make the difference. What choices we make, how we get things done, who we address are all very important to our success. So, you know, when you connect the dots between energy and the challenges that we have, this is a very, very unique time. And like I said, we have created this forum with a lot of not just kind of broadcasting to you, but interactive sessions. 
And I encourage you to make sure that you ask questions of the panel when we have time for that. And when you're in the round table, you know, listen and also transmit what you're seeing and what you're hearing. We have the advantage of having almost every state and provinces represented here. So we've got North America really represented. And we've got great voices, people that are really making a difference. I know every time I go to these and I sit and I listen and I hear things like, oh, I didn't think about that. Or, gee, that's something that we should pursue. And so I hope that while you're here connecting with each other, that you follow up. If you hear something and think, go get somebody. Go ask them, hey, you know, you talked about this. How are you doing that? Because it's one thing that I've found about the people at Clear Result and the customers that we work with, they're very collaborative. There's no secret sauce of, oh, like, I'm going to hide this and I'm not going to tell anybody. What's really neat about this industry is people share because there is a common goal that everyone's trying to do. They're trying to make those energy goals that we have, and that ultimately makes this a better place and a better planet. So actively use that while you're here. Um, it will make a difference, I guarantee. If you find one, two, or three things that you can take back home with you that will make a difference for the state or the company that you work at, I challenge you to do that because I guarantee you those nuggets are going to be here over the next couple days. You know, um, every session in this forum is really about making those connections. And that's why we've kind of made the group smaller. We've allowed for time to collaborate, whether it be the sustainable diverse partnerships. There's no place that I go that, you know, having diverse contractors or diverse people helping to work on the programs that we run is not a top of mind. The reality is it's very important that we actually reflect the end customers that we're all serving. And we have a very diverse set of end customers, from low income to moderate income to high income, a very diverse set. And I say whether it's low income or high income or moderate income, everybody can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference. So as long as we focus on that and we make sure that we represent the very audiences that we're serving, that will be a win. And we have a session on that. And then energy advisors and decarbonization, everyone, you know, we're talking about saving energy and we're also talking about, okay, how do we decarbonize over the future? So there's an opportunity for us to round table and discuss that as well. And demand response, delivery through partnerships, the reality is demand response is real, it's coming. It's not about the technology. It's about how do we get our customers to adopt the technology? And I'm always amazed when I'm out uh, talking with customers and actually end customers. And, you know, we have a great program that's being offered, you know, on behalf of our, our utilities. And the customer doesn't believe it. And anyone who's dealt with them knows that, well, we have this great program. It's free. You're going to be able to do this. Nothing's free. Nothing's free. Everything has a cost. So we have to figure out how to market and to build trust. Build trust. And where we really start is in this room, building trust. We translate that out to our customers, and the reality is that's another way that we can make a significant difference, significant difference. So the technology's there. We gotta get it adopted faster, and we gotta get it adopted by more, and that will help us handle like these 106 peak load days that we're having today in Austin, Texas. You know, um, there is a tremendous amount of optimism. And I, I say this tongue in cheek, but you know, if you traveled here to be at 105 degree temperature, you're a believer. You are absolutely a believer. And I appreciate that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, like I said, we're gonna have a lot of great people to collaborate with. There's a lot of smarts in the room. And I hope that you leverage it and use it. Because I am very optimistic. The money's gonna be there, and then it's all gonna come down to the people. What do we collectively do to use this money well to really make a difference? And that'll be kind of the theme of the things that we're talking about and the breakout sessions, uh, making a difference and connecting as people. So very excited to get things done. It'll take all of us to get the job done, um, but the job is, is certainly a worthy cause. So the first one, which is kind of the Daddy Llama <laughs> size thing that's coming down the pike, is IRA. You know, it was uh, announced almost a year ago. Uh, here are their documents coming. Uh, the debate is it triple pages, 
Thank God it's not you know, like, you know, 1,000 pages, but it's going to be pretty, pretty complex that's coming down. And, you know, um, it is a massive opportunity. Um, how we use that money, uh, how the states decide to deploy the money, is going to be really critical to the success of the program. But they're all programs. They're all dollars. At the end of the day, it's about people. People are going to use that money and hopefully use it in the right way. And we'll be very excited about that. So, you know, for our first session, which I think is a great one just to kick things off, we're going to have Tennessee Valley Authority, the state of Tennessee, and the National Association of State Energy Offices participating uh, in this. And, you know, for those who aren't in Tennessee, let me tell you, they're very progressive on this, very progressive on this. And so I think it's going to be a great session that we'll have. And, you know, you've got the leaders that are really pushing this thing. Uh, across the board. So they realize, you know, I've talked with all of them, there's challenges and there's huge opportunity. Huge challenges, huge opportunity. And, you know, time is ticking on it. <laughs> time is ticking on it. So things are going to start happening very fast as we enter 24 and as we close out 23. And, you know, before I turn it over, I just want to say that I look forward to connecting with you. Um, I know if I see someone standing there, I'll come up and, and talk to you. Do not be afraid or do not, I, please, I welcome it. Come grab me, tell, you, tell me what you're doing and you know, the challenges that you have. Because that's part of the connection for me too, is understanding um, what we can do to serve this marketplace better and serve you better. And with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mandy Falk, our Clear Result uh, Program Director, who she will be moderating and introducing uh, our keynote panel. So Mandy. I've been with Clear Result for 14 years now, and so I am very fortunate to be on this panel with the industry experts here that you'll have a chance to um, hear from. Um, but before we get to the question and answer portion, just a few notes about the session and the IRA. As all of you are likely aware, there is, this is a massive 700-page <laughs> bill which intends to introduce healthcare policy, um, drug costs, and then just the cleaner energy itself. We only have an hour today, um, so we're, we're going to really dial in on the energy efficiency part of it. So the impact of this bill should yield unprecedented results. Um, it is going to be $8 billion. Uh, sorry about that, there we go. Um, $8 billion in energy efficiency rebates that will be administered by the states. In addition, there's going to be $12 billion in um, energy federal tax credits. So this is going to impact millions of households, and in particular, it's going to really have a positive impact on low-income customers. And probably most of you remember the last investment that Congress took in the energy efficiency was ERA back in 2009 which was a $20 million investment, which seemed huge back then, but now compared to the billions of dollars we're talking about, seems like chump change now, right? <laughs> so who thought, or who knew $20 million would turn into chump change? But really, um, you know, this is going to be an amazing opportunity for our customers. And so it's going to take all of us to collaborate together to be successful. And so with the robustness of the IRA, also, comes complexity of the stakeholders. We have the federal government, we have the states, we have utilities, we have workforce, and we have our customers that we're going to be serving. So let me, little audience participation, show of hands, who feels connected with your state energy office? Okay, we have a, a few, awesome. All right, who doesn't feel connected to your energy office? There we go. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> Hopefully, whether you do feel connected or you don't feel connected, by the end of this session, you'll hear from our industry experts and you'll learn how to engage more with your state energy office. You'll learn how to you know, get started engaging, um, but there's gonna be something here for all of us to learn. Um, 
so some of you may have attended the IRA Fundamentals yesterday, um, learned some really great things in that session, so thank you, Keith. Um, but today, we hope to build upon those lessons and hear from these industry experts and have actionable lessons that you can come out of this session with so you can take back with you, because it is going to take all of us working together. So without further delay, um, I am going to turn it over for introductions to our panel. So Rodney, if I may turn yeah. it over to you for introductions. Thank you, Mandy, and a uh, great thank you to Clear Result for having uh, me here and having Nazio here. We very much value the relationship with Clear Result and with also many, we'll, we'll, we'll see more hands raised next year, I hope, in you know, engagement with state energy offices. Um, so uh, I am Rodney Sobin, I'm a senior fellow with NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials. We're the association of the 56 state and territorial energy offices and District of Columbia. Uh, our members are, and, and, and what we do is we support them, we are a resource to them, we alert them to the IRA and Bill and the other opportunities, we work with uh, the Department of Energy and EPA and other agencies as well as with the Congress to be their voice in Washington, D.C. We support exchange among the state energy offices and peer learning. We also support their outreach and their uh, collaboration with other sorts of agencies and other associations. So we have very good relationship and a lot of partnerships with NARUC, National Governors Association, National Conference of State Legislators. Just last week we had an event with AASHTO, the uh, Association of the Highway uh, <coughs> Transportation Officials on uh, EV charging infrastructure. Uh, with the environmental agencies and increasingly with uh, economic development agencies. So we are uh, a, a resource to them, we uh, work with them, we work with the uh, federal government to advance their interests. Uh, with respect to the IRA and I would add Bill, it, it, it's artificial to separate the, the two laws. They really work together and some of the provisions actually some of the DOE uh, funding opportunities refer to both laws. So don't artificially separate, this is IRA and this is Bill. But anyway, um, we are uh, you know, working with them. Uh, the, the energy offices have multiple <coughs> roles. Uh, they support, uh, sorry, they do program development and you will hear quite a bit about, for example, the uh, residential energy efficiency and uh, electrification rebate program. That's just one, I think that's the $8 billion. That's just one piece of what the state energy offices are involved in and interested in. I mentioned EV infrastructure. They uh, work with uh, the hydrogen and uh, carbon capture hubs working regionally. Uh, the, um, the funding opportunities. So there's a lot going on and uh, we are working with them to help them in their program development and implementation to support and partner with others to uh, access those resources. So there's some discussion about how much money is coming to state energy offices or coming through state energy offices. Certainly that's critical for the energy offices, but even more critical are other resources that can be brought into the state to their localities, to the utilities, to private sector, to tribes, to, uh, to leverage those resources and advance energy efficiency, clean energy manufacturing, and all sorts of other things. And I think I've been babbling enough, so I will hand it to you. All right, great, thank you. Uh, so good morning, my name is Nola Hastings. I'm with the uh, Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, uh, TDEC, as we call it. Uh, TDEC has approximately 15 uh, organizations under that banner, um, anything from water resources to air quality to sustainability, and of course the Office of Energy Programs. Um, so uh, the, the Office of Energy Programs is the governor-designated state energy office, so we're nice people, reach out. <laughs> um, so TDEC, uh, we you know, provide uh, education and outreach, uh, technical guidance for energy efficiency, energy management, um, renewable energy, energy uh, planning, yes. 
as well as um, electrification and transportation. So as Rodney mentioned, we play a number of roles. Um, and as in regard to the next slide, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, Tennessee has been allocated about $167 million. Um, as we've mentioned, the guidance isn't out. We, we don't know what that's going to look like, but we've taken a preliminary look at the impact that we could have throughout the state um, based on who utilizes the rebates, if it's single family, multifamily, um, LMI customers, non-LMI, and it looks like we could impact anywhere from 40, almost 4,800 to 22,000 homes. So it's a big range, um, but it, an opportunity for a big impact. So. Hi, I'm Frank Rapley. I'm senior manager at TVA in the Energy Services and Programs Group, ESP. And uh, uh, I have the good fortune of, of operating the residential programs in association with our local power companies and having Mandy as the lead of our uh, clear result team across our entire region. And I get to work with the uh, State Energy Office of Tennessee very closely and have for a long time. A little bit about TVA. We are the nation's largest public power um, uh, entity, generator and transmitter. We cover about 80,000 square miles, uh, parts of seven states, almost all of Tennessee except for one spot. Uh, and we have 153 local power companies that are municipals and cooperatives who are our wholesale customers. They're also our partners and we deliver energy efficiency programming in concert with them across that, that region. Um, about 10 million uh, residents growing, I don't know, Nashville, we have Nashville and we have Huntsville, which are two, two of the fastest growing metros in the US, so uh, people keep moving from California, they'll, they'll have 11 million really soon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, 90 years old uh, this year. Next slide, please. So when we think about the IRA, we really think about this as we want to see this done, the IRA done the right way. And what does that mean? What that means is that everyone has to benefit. The members of the cooperatives, the customers of the municipals need to see a benefit out of this. The local power companies need to, to see a benefit. The state energy office needs to see a benefit out of this. It needs to be done in a way that everybody wins, that uh, the TVA system is not impacted in ways that are detrimental to it at the same time, and uh, we want to make this thing a success. I would also add to this list contractors. Contractors need to win as well as we, as we go through this, and we have some great contractors in our network, and so we're really excited about this opportunity. Let's go to the next slide. So finally, so what have we been doing? Well, uh, I think the ink wasn't even dry from Joe Biden's signature when we started reaching out to uh, energy offices. And of course, they said, whoa, we're working on IIJA. We understand, but come back and see us. So, so what we did was we joined NASIO uh, so that we could be part of the discussions that NASIO was holding with the state energy offices, uh, in the preliminary guidance that they were going to be giving to DOE. We, we um, were... We worked on those guiding principles and gave NASIO feedback on those. Uh, and then we also, uh, 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 we, we replied to the RFI that was done by DOE, uh, kind of stating how we thought this, this whole thing could work. And we are you know, currently working and talking with the state of Tennessee about how this might work utilizing the platforms and programs that we've already built and are already in running across the valley and how we could integrate these things. So we're working through workflows and all those things. And of course, my slide here says, and waiting for guidance in July, make that, <laughs> make that the latter half of August. But we're really excited about this opportunity. All right, thank you all for the introductions. Um, so I've got a few um, pre-written questions that I'm gonna ask the panel. And then um, for the next half of the session, I'm going to turn it over to you um, for the audience to ask a question. So as we go through it, got a question, hold on to it, and then we'll, we'll get to it in just a minute. Um, so Frank, if you don't mind, if I could sure. come to you first. So there's been a lot of discussion about state energy offices and utility right. collaboration. And as you said, like, you jumped right on it before the ink even dried. 
so can you give us from your perspective why you thought it was so important to engage early and start yeah. collaborating? Well, yeah, a, a, a number of things. First of all, one was just simply to raise our hand and say, we want to be partners with you. May not be ready to do it yet, but we want to get on your radar yeah. so that as things progress, uh, we can have further discussions when you're ready. And we're going to go ahead and start working on this right now about how we might be able to use our program platforms to do that. And there are a lot of reasons why we thought that was important. You know, one was uh, having experienced the ARRA and understanding, you know, the, the, the complexity of running programming like this uh, across, across big areas. The bill is very short for, this, for these, these particular things. There was, there's really not a lot, there's not a lot there. So constructing the whole framework to make this work in a way that does benefit everyone and is, um, assures that, that, that particularly the low income customers, the customers below 80% AMI, benefit and see uh, reductions in their, their uh, utility bills and also see better health outcomes and all of those things you want to see in, in that really, how do we build a framework that makes sure that, that that happens? So we were really concerned about that. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to, to, to reach out early, just to start, the, start the, um, the, the discussions and then be thinking and planning as this thing goes forward. And if, you, if you're a utility out there and you have not talked to your state energy office, I would urge you to at least you know, make that contact, and if, if you're the least bit interested in, you know, in being an implementer and using your program st uh, structures to do that, then you need to be doing that, at, I think, r right now. I would be, anyway. Uh, the other thing, too, is we have a lot of new energy efficiency programs coming out, and so we thought this was a great opportunity to integrate those into, into these particular offers to, to be able to, to layer those things in as well as we go forward. And we wanted to do that in a way that was, that was very orderly as well. Okay. Sure. Uh, Nola, would you like to add anything from your perspective on when TVA started engaging? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's important to note that TVA is an anomaly in terms of, um, <laughs> I mean, that, that it covers, yeah. it, for Tennessee, it blankets almost the entire state, like Frank said, just a small portion. So I think, I feel like we're in a pretty enviable position in terms of uh, exploring the opportunity to work with um, TVA. Um, the state does not regulate TVA. We do not direct how they spend their ratepayer dollars. But as Frank mentioned, they have these robust programs that already exist. So, um, you know, which already are targeting the markets that are focused um, through IIJA and IRA. So our current path, as Frank mentioned, is to see about contracting with TBA, taking advantage of, I mean, IRA is a monster. I mean, <laughs> I, I started with the state in November of last year and you know, just started reading through all these, you know, all this legislation, and and I was reading the IRA, and I, I just thought like, oh, <laughs> how how do we do this, um, you know? And then here comes Frank, and um, so this is the path that we're we're going down. Obviously, you know, nothing's finalized. We have a lot of internal and external approvals that will need to be met. Um, but there's a lot of advantages for Tennessee households if, if this path is approved. Okay. So if I could add to that, uh, you know, I certainly I endorse that. I mean, you, you should be working with your, or reaching out to your state energy offices. And it's very important, I think, to, to have the utility ratepayer programs complement and not supplant these additional resources and get them to work together. Now, we know that there are gonna be a lot of uh, uh, nitty-gritty technical issues, you know, the cost effectiveness, uh, does it count to your ears or your EAPs or whatever your standards are, uh, the M and V issues and that, which makes it all the more important to have that communication. And uh, most of the state energy offices do not themselves actually run like as program administrators, EE programs, but they'll farm it out or they'll provide funding or resources to other, to, to other groups. So as a, for instance, in Wisconsin, the ratepayer program is run by Focus on Energy, and the Wisconsin Energy Office is contracting with Focus on Energy to run the rebate program. 
now exactly how they're going to, you know, do the accounting that this is this program and that's that pro program and who counts, you know, which, uh, which pieces. That, I think, still needs to be uh, worked out. But the point is not to reinvent wheels, to take advantage of existing expertise, uh, to take, uh, uh, take advantage of the expertise of the utilities and the program administrators. That doesn't mean every state's going to do it that way, but certainly you should be working with your state energy offices and as uh, relevant your PUCs. Thank you. So, Rodney, I'll stay with you and ask a question. Okay. <laughs> so the state energy offices are receiving an unprecedented amount of funding. So what are you hearing from them as the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge with all this funding? Oy. <laughs> There's a lot, uh, and I, I just want to digress and say, if you look at the uh, White House uh, guide on the IRA, there are o over 100 programs in there. Uh, actually, the DOE side is over 100 programs. It's even more in the White House because it's the EPA and DOT and DOI and other letters of the alphabet as well, and it's similar with the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. So there's a lot of money. Uh, I, I would modify your question a little bit. Yes, there's money coming to and through the state energy offices. But the state energy offices are not only focused on what money comes through their accounts, but they're interested in, in, in funding and resources coming to their states to meet state objectives. So a lot of what they're also doing is working with the private sector and localities and tribes and NGOs to apply for funding and to partner with them. So it's more than how much money does the uh, TDEC get or NYSERDA or the Washington Department of Commerce. It's how much resource can be brought to the state and often the state in collaboration with other states when it comes to things like the hydrogen hubs and so forth. So a uh, tremendous opportunity. I won't point to a particular example. The challenges, time and bandwidth, a lot of money coming quickly, uh, limited resources. We know that in some states, the legislature has uh, added some resources and some hiring authority to the energy office to help uh, facilitate these things. There's also need in most of the provisions for non-federal matching funds in some states are coming up to the plate and offering money, not necessarily all states, but that's helpful too. So the time and bandwidth, uh, the DOE guidance or tardiness or lack thereof is, is in this case, not to pick on DOE. They, they're under the same constraint of having to push out a lot of work and a lot of stuff in a very short time uh, with limited resources themselves as far as staff and contractors. And these are complex topics, like we just alluded to, you know, the issues of, okay, well, how much is in the rebate program? How much is in the ratepayer program? How much will be, uh, uh, you know, tax credits for you and me to buy, you know, heat pumps or whatever, or EVs? And who gets credit for that? That, that, that ain't easy. Nola, would you like to add anything from your perspective? Yeah, I think the opportunities are, you know, probably obvious in terms of this is you know an amazing opportunity um, to help in energy efficiency and just with climate change and, and all those things but um, even though Tennessee has low residential energy rates um, there are still parts of the state you know the pockets that have a high energy burden so uh, we look forward to being able to um, help households lower their energy costs and um, you know, hopefully improve their indoor air quality in the process. Um, there are challenges, definitely. Uh, the timelines, Rodney alluded to that. Um, we just have these back-to-back -back deadlines of all of these uh, grant applications. And then some of the grants have um, requirements that the money has to go out to sub grantees in 180 days. So you know, we're designing, I don't know, 20 plus programs and trying to get everything stood up and out the door in a short, pretty short time frame. Um, and at the same time, tracking new funding opportunities, um, you know, keeping, making sure we don't miss anything. Um, staffing, I mean, we are hearing that from 
Mo well, not most, but some other state energy offices in terms of just getting people hired, onboarded, and trained. Um, so we, they won't be on board probably to help with grant applications, but all these grants are gonna have um, quite a bit of reporting that comes with them. So it's gonna be really important to get help um, so that we stay compliant with reporting. Um, managing customer expectations is another challenge. Uh, people tend to know that this money's coming, but they don't realize it's not here yet. So, you know, we're fielding questions and answering emails about how do I get my money? And so, um, you know, just helping people understand that we're working on that, it's not, we're not quite ready. Um, and then finally, just federal regulations. Um, there's Davis-Bacon Act, there's Build America, Buy America, there's um, NEPA, there's Justice 40, that all, all those regulations come with this federal funding. So we need to make sure the state's compliant and we need to make sure that we flow those requirements down to sub-grantees and that they comply as well. So there's a lot of stuff. Let me add just another tidbit. One of the difficulties at the state level is also uh, the state legislature is the one that appropriates the money and sometimes there's a process that the energy office or another state agency may need to uh, you know, provide resources and do hiring, but how does the federal money mesh with the state appropriations process? So that can be a difficulty as well. Okay. Thank you. And Noah, coming back to you. Okay. So with the state energy offices experiencing the incredible increases in funding, both IIJA and IRA, Aside from TVA coming in, um, so how is the state um, energy office planning to effectively deploy all of the funding? Like, do you have the plan laid out, or are you still scrambling a little bit? Or um, you know, what's been tremendously helpful is NASIO's putting on lots of webinars that are helping so much. DOE has webinars for state energy offices to talk to each other. So sharing our concepts, our ideas among states has been really helpful. Um, we've looked at existing programs um, for all the different grant opportunities. We've looked at braiding funding between the federal programs um, in terms of IRA, the home energy rebates. Um, we've mentioned that TVA already has robust programs. Um, they already do income qualification, which is a component of these programs. Um, they have existing relationships with the local power companies throughout the state, which we, we don't necessarily have that direct relationship as the state energy office. They maintain a quality contractor network they have subcontractors that were procured through competitive bid. So there's a lot of advantages of, of using that, those existing programs. Um, not, none of that is approved yet, of course. Uh, we still need to you know, get a lot of approvals. But if it is approved, that would result in the state being able to more quickly deploy the funds. Um, TBA is, would take on some of the administrative burden of that, which uh, lowers the cost for the state to run the program, which ultimately means more money goes out to Tennessee households. Um, so that's, that's on the IRA side. In terms of IIJA, we've got a number of programs working there too. Our state energy plan has been approved by DOE. We, we identified about 13 uh, sub-projects that we want to do within the state energy plan through IIJA. Um, those range anywhere from sub-metering to EV infrastructure, resiliency hubs. Um, so we're working, you know, we've, we're meeting all the time about, okay, who's owning what program and just laying out the pathway for that. Um, the IIJA grid resilience program, the application, we're waiting for approval from DOE on that. Um, but our first step would be convening a stakeholder working group so we can get input on um, program uh, finalization. Um, and then we would be uh, submitting or um, asking for uh, uh, proposals for that grant money um, for applications. And then um, on the revolving loan fund, that's the most recent grant we submitted. Um, 
we have followed a path uh, working with TVA there. Uh, and so we, again, we took a really extensive look at what existed within state departments and then um, outside of you know, state agencies, what was there? Where, where should we park these funds to get the most um, out of it? And um, we ultimately settled on a series of loan loss reserves. Um, they, they already exist to some extent with TVA. Um, they have third party vendors. Um, but the goal with the state uh, loan loss reserve is to try to provide funding for subprime borrowers. So the, the interest rate now excludes a number of people um, because of their credit score. So we're hoping to provide um, that, that funding source for those subprime borrowers. And then one, uh, and that would be residential and small commercial. And then one of the loan loss reserves would come capital from TBA backstopped by state, these, these um, grant dollars. Um, to help fill the gap between the IRA rebates. I mean, we recognize these households may want to do these programs, but the rebate in, in I think most cases isn't going to cover the whole cost. So a barrier or a challenge for households is I want to do it, but I don't have you know $10,000 cash to do this program. So one of the loan loss reserves would be um, for a program to provide funding um, or loans to those customers that need to need to fill that gap. Um, and then also in the RLF, there's 25% that a state can use for grants and technical assistance. So we've decided to take that 25%, braid it with the energy efficiency and conservation block grant program, which uh, we're working on now. It's due July 31st. Um, so we'll braid those two sources of funding to be able to use the grant it has to be focused towards uh, low-income households or um, uh, commercial buildings with fewer than 500 employees. So that's, that's the path that we're going to propose. Um, and then we would look at uh, buildings that serve a dual purpose. So say a K through 12 school that also um, serves as an emergency shelter or county-owned hospitals. So that's, that's kind of our, our path now. Um, and then again, uh, I don't know, last week, this week, contractor training grants yep, and, right, yep. um, and building codes. So two more things to be looking at. So that's, that's a lot. it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm tired. Just here. Um, so speaking of contractors, um, Frank, so frequently discussed concern with IRA funding is the workforce shortages and the contractor training. So how do you feel our national workforce is prepared to deliver on the IRA funds? Well, and, just, yeah. yeah, just in general, I mean, we all, and I think probably every, every utility out there and, and clear result uh, where you're operating, programming, running networks knows that uh, a lot of people that are in the trades are aging out and there's not this robust pipeline uh, to take their places and it's a big concern. Uh, so, so, they, so there's, there's workforce development that has to be done to get people that can work with existing contractors, right? And so we, we, it's kind of like we do some of that work. We've got some training things that we do along with, uh, well, the one in Nashville along with um, uh, uh, the uh, Goodwill there that runs, a, they run a uh, four-week uh, basic construction skills class. And then we have a, a, a facility there so that we can do some what I would call, you know, building science 101 and then get them connected up. That's our aspiration to do is get them into our contractors kind of in entry level jobs and then they can progress from there. But we need a whole lot more of that. I mean, that's that's the thing we need to be catching, uh, you know, folks who are leaving high school and uh, uh, showing them this opportunity to work in our industry and do this and that you can you can make a great living and you can own your own business and you can do a lot of things if you'll if you if you're willing to go into the business and um, so we got to continue to work on that really hard the good news is we have a big contractor network already and they and so we so when i just think about the you know our our situation i think it's in, we're, we're in pretty good shape but there are places where um in particularly in rural areas where contractors just don't exist. I mean, there, there's just, particularly for things like air sealing and insulation, they just don't exist. 
Uh, so we have to work with contractors to get them to work further out of their range uh, to be able to do that or else we, we can't, uh, we, we, it's hard to get those services out there in those extremely rural areas. So there's a, that, I would say that's, that, that is probably one of our biggest concerns is that uh, you know, nationally, I'd say that, that, that we, we, this is a problem that, that we've got to solve. I don't have an answer, but there's going to be some funding out there for it, and we're sure hoping that we can partner to do something. Maybe I can ask a question then. Yes. Uh, so are you working with uh, community colleges and, and high school vocational programs yes. and uh, other we're, sorts We're working of... with technical schools as well. Yeah. There's a TCAT system in, in Tennessee, the technical uh, colleges. Um, a lot of them have programs, uh, and so we, you know, we've reached out to them. It's, it's a little difficult to integrate with them. I know, you know, Mandy, we've, we've tried this several times. Uh, we're working with a tech, uh, tech school in Memphis, more tech, uh, to, and we're building another facility in Memphis. So we have one in Memphis, we have one in Nashville, we have one in Knoxville, uh, where, we can, where we can partner with schools to do that. And high schools are really the next step for us mm -hmm. to look at. Yeah. Okay, so that is all of the pre-written questions. So now I'd like to turn it over to the audience. We have a couple people in the mic are back with mics. If you have a question, just raise your hand so we can get the mic to you so we can all hear you. Nope. It, over here. Hi, thank you so much. That was very, very interesting content. Uh, thank you for sharing those insights and kudos to you all for being kind of ahead of the game. Um, so I'm Ryan Pinto, I'm from Clear Result. I, I am on the marketing side of our business. Have you thought about um, marketing effectiveness in these conversations, particularly engaging low to moderate income where we have challenges just through marketing uh, promotional campaigns? to drive that engagement. Um, have you considered with the influx of these funds needing more participation, um, how your marketing campaigns may evolve? Right, so I can just speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, we have an income qualified program right now that, that uh, is uh, either 200% federal poverty level, like the, like the weatherization assistance program, or 80% AMI or below whichever is higher, because we have places where sometimes 80% is higher and sometimes 200% is, depending on the county and the area. So we're, we're in that space right now. Um, we do really well in the metro areas uh, where uh, there are a lot of um, service providers that you can partner with for in, in, in referring customers or families back and forth. The, the, the metro areas, we, uh, that outreach through those, through those partners that are already there is really great, but we've done lots of things, events, community centers, all kinds of things to do that. It's really, uh, in those communities, you have to be in the community. You have to be working with the people in the community who are there every day, where they know the families, and they're a trusted resource. I mean, I'm from TVA and I'm here to help. They wouldn't even know who I was. Um, so, that's, so in the metros, that works pretty well. The rural areas are tough. Um, so we're trying to find some, uh, some methods to work with agencies that have a broader reach in those areas. We work with the, um, the CAP agencies that are a lot of times implementing the LIHEAP program and implementing the Weatherization Assistance Program. Um, we're really interested in, in organizations like the Area Councils on Aging who do that kind of work. Also, uh, looking at, at the, um, the Medicaid providers uh, in, in those areas who may have caseworkers working directly. And then the other thing is reaching out to communities that we may not necessarily be, be, be hitting. For instance, in Tennessee, we have a, a, a large Latino population. We just weren't touching the community. So we partnered with Centro Hispano of East Tennessee to really develop for us a way to, to help us gain access to the community to get participation in that community. We have a big Kurdish community in Nashville. So there are all these sub-communities that, that you've got to find the organizations that can help you gain, uh, gain trust and access so that you can, you can actually get uh, programming done in those areas. So it's not easy. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. One quick follow-up for Nola. You mentioned um, customers are reaching out to you saying, how do I get my money? How are they finding out about this? And do you think based on that early indicator that um, you know, there will be a lot of pent-up demand for these, for these incentives? Um, I, I think there's just um, general information. I don't know. I don't really watch TV, so I don't know if it's coming out, you know, through the news medias or what. But, um, you know, there, there are income qualifications. So I, our question is having to level set expectations because the people who are reaching out may not be qualified to take advantage of some of these programs. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to answer the questions the best we can now, but to, to tag on to Frank's response in terms of customer outreach and communication and marketing, that's something we're thinking a lot about, and if we, if our pathway to contract with TVA is approved, it will give the state energy office um, more uh, bandwidth to deal with those kind of things, because as Rich said, you, you do need trust. And I've worked on programs where it's free and you know the water district is paying for it and they're like, no thanks. Mm -hmm. So it's it's gonna be a big lift. It's you know, Rich said it, it's great to get the money out there, but if you don't have anybody taking you up on the offer. And yeah. and, and the sort of the inverse, the, your second question, the issue there are a lot of people who just heard through the general uh, you know, news that there are gonna be rebates and uh, tax uh, credits and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, there have been a, a couple of energy efficiency uh, NGOs who have sort of jumped the gun and talked it up and have an online calculator. So people are saying, oh, well, if I do this, I can get this back. And then they go to the state energy office. Well, we don't have the program yet, which can set up people for a lot of disappointment. And then that runs into the, you know, you're no longer trusted. So how do you then, when, when the program is up, how do you then market it? Another question? We stunned them. We stunned them, yeah. <laughs> Give them all the information. They need. <laughs> so maybe um, building on that question about how do customers <laughs> learn about the programs, once they learn about the programs, um, clearly from your discussion, there's a lot of complexity, not only with the programs themselves, but braiding those funds with other programs. Do you have thoughts on how to insulate customers and contractors from those complexities and make it simple and easy for them to participate once they get their foot in the door? That's a good question. So this is this is thing. This is sort of the, at the heart of this because you really have to you have to have a process to bring some bring a, a customer in and you, you you've almost got to in, income you have to income qualify them because because then. To know what they're eligible for, that's kind of the first, kind of the first step of this. And then the question, and the kind of way we're looking at this is, then how do you get them into a channel that is um, is, is the appropriate channel? So if you're over 150 percent area median income, you can participate in the weatherization program, uh, but not the electrification program. If you're, you know. Uh, 150 uh, or below 80 and 150, you can participate in the in the electrification program. You could also participate in the other program as well, but you can't layer those incentives on the same measure. Uh, so, it's a lot of complexity in how you how you even administer the braiding of the two programs. Um, and and so, kind of the way we look at it is we have to have we have to have channels that that will accommodate various income levels it's what you want to find with, with any of them you want to say th you're, this is all you're eligible for so now so let's take a whole home approach to this particularly when we're talking about below 80 percent ami we shouldn't be going in and doing one measure and that's it that's the wrong approach here we need to be going in and doing a whole home approach we need to be be um even if we're even if it's on the electrification side which has no provision in it for modeling or measuring at all. Even there, we need to be going and modeling that home, which we will do, and, and coming up with a package that will, that, that will be the most efficient for that home. And, it's, and, and my, my belief is, if it doesn't lower their utility costs, we have failed. Uh, and that's my big concern, is that, that, uh, 
you have one program that's 100% based upon modeled or measured savings. You have another that does, it's, doesn't, there's nothing there. There's, there's absolutely no provision at all for that, unless DOE puts out guidance that says that. But, but, but as, the, as the act is written, there's not. And uh, it was really, it is a straight electrification play. Now it's got all these other measures in it, you know, like rewiring and upgrading panels and, and some energy efficiency, um, you know, some weatherization that you can do. But if you, if, if, if you don't take a whole home approach, you run the risk of that family, you know, getting one of those, you know, somebody throws in a heat pump and the ducting is shot and nothing happens there and the house is, uh, you know, is not well insulated and it's, it's not well air sealed. And then I'll, guess who they're going to call when their electric bill goes through the roof? My local power company. So that's what, that's what those guys are worried about. It will, have, it will have impact on them if this is not done right. And you've really got to start by bringing everybody through, understanding what, they're, what, what is available, and, and then kind of working with them to triage the best package together. Not simple. Not simple, and it's more complex because the customer may not necessarily know that they're you know, in the low income or right. not. They just want to get a project on their, uh, he, you know, their their furnace uh, broke down, so they need to do something. So are they going to go to Lowe's or Home Depot, or are they going to call, uh, you know, Joe the uh, HVAC technician? And how does the program work depending on who's taking the order? So I go to Lowe's, and then they get their contract. You know, they have a list of contractors, or am I calling the contractor directly? Do I really want? Lowe's to know what my, you know, if I'm income qualified, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. And then there's the tax credit piece too, if, right. if I'm not under a low income program. So it's the rebate program, it's a tax credit program. That's right. And there may be the utility, the rate payer program as well. Mm -hmm. So no good answer. Yeah, <laughs> it's, but it's, you got, that's what you got to think through. What are those program channels? And that's why if you don't put some real structure around this through, you know, kind of a utility program process, it's going to be the Wild West, and that's not going to be good for anyone. We have a question back. One, we have time for about one more question. Hi, Jonathan Cohen from the Department of Energy. Hi, Rod. Hi, Frank. Good to see you, and thank you for everything. I've got a, a question for you about... Uh, making sure that all this money is not going to be a one and done. One of the big issues I have with our efficiency programs is that, first off, people can't stand contractors coming into their homes. They don't want to have uh, this work done uh, all that frequently. But people, uh, people are not treated as ongoing customers. They, they have a window roughly once every 10 years where work comes in and that's it. But this is a great opportunity to establish a relationship where people can have their house treated like they treat their cars, where they know they need to get a tune-up. They need their, their, their car to get checked out so it doesn't break down. So on the hottest day of the year, they don't have that piece of equipment. They don't know how old it is. They don't know how long it lasts. Break down at the worst possible time. So I'm going to ask how you think programs can create relationships where people uh, have a contractor come out once a year and take advantage of the, uh, the legislation that provides opportunities uh, for doing work right. every year because you can't, under the legislation, do all the work in one shot and get all the benefits. It's not structured that way. So what would you suggest in terms of uh, programs and the people that work on the programs in this room to create those relationships for an ongoing uh, effort? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and what we've done in the past, as Mandy knows, is that that is the, that is the key because work does not happen in a home all at once, right? Um, this is one of the things, you know, the... The, the home performance model where you go in, you do everything, you do $40,000 work or whatever it is in a home, that is like the exception, not the rule. The fact is um, homeowners do work overtime as they have the 
funding or the opportunity to do it. And uh, what the best way to do that is to establish a plan on the front end with that homeowner that works with them, kind of a customized approach that says, okay, we go out at your home, here are the things that, here are, the, here are the, the biggest bang for your buck, the things that you can do. Now, you can't do them all right now, but let's, uh, let's prioritize what you're going to do, do what you can do. And then, and, and a lot of times that happens when there's an emergency situation, by the way, as, as you just mentioned, usually HVAC has gone out. But, but then the key, the, the trick for the program is to continue, is to continue to have that ongoing communication with that, with that uh, uh, customer and an ability for them to keep, continue to re-engage with you. And there's a lot of ways you can do that, um, you know, through, through outreach, because you have all that you have, first of all, you have a full lot of their, their house, you know what, how old everything in that house is, you know, you know when things are gonna come up, if you will use, if your systems are robust and can do it, then you can, be, can, you can continue to reach out over time and do those things. And I think, it, you know, if, you, if it's a utility program, you have to be reaching out over time and, and continue to do that, to make that work. That's, I mean, that's, and, and, and it's really customized to their home because, and if you have the data set and your systems are robust enough, you can do that. That's a real good question. Um, and remember the, the IRA and IIJA are not solely util, I, I know that there's a utility program orientation here, but it's much bigger than that. So it, it, it's a bigger question, but within the utility program context, the utility of course has a, continuous relationship yes. with the customer. So I think there are opportunities to engage. Um, in, uh, you know, we heard earlier, uh, you know, R Rich had mentioned about uh, demand response programs. I like to talk about demand flexibility, not the old fashioned, it's a hot day, turn stuff down. But you can have a continual relationship when you have smart thermostat programs, water heater programs. In some parts of the country, there are battery programs where the residential battery owner actually gets a credit or, or you know, some compensation for the battery providing grid services. And those are mechanisms to keep an ongoing and uh, remunerative uh, relationship with right. the customer. And maybe that's the opportunity to bring in, oh, did you, you, know, did you have your HVAC uh, service done? And uh, you know, these sorts of things. I would just add too, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about, is there's so much education that needs to happen, um, communication, and, and as the state, that will be a role that we play. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a big task, but we really do need to communicate uh, with households throughout the state and just educate them on these programs. Okay. So it's about time to wrap up. So if I may, one last question for each of you um, from your each of your unique perspectives, what's the first step you would recommend others to take? Wow. Others as, as in? You can define others, whoever you would like I to address. I would say, I'll just go back to, it, to, to, the, to the utilities in the room. I think you need to, to open up that relationship with your state energy office. It's not, not a lot of hands went up uh, at, when that question was asked at the beginning. And, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're there to serve your state. And, uh, and I know, of course, you know, if, if you're a, you know, regulated utility under a public service commission, that can be a little tricky at times. Um, but, um, but I think it's, I think that's important. And one other thing that we're trying to do is because, because we have a significant territory in a number of states, we're trying to understand and meet with the, the other utilities in the state who have significant territory to understand what they're thinking. I mean, what their plans are, are they, are they interested in collaborating with us on, on, a, on a statewide plan, those kinds of things. But I think, I think you gotta get in the game somehow, first of all. Yeah, I agree. I think just communicating is the most important thing. Um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to talk to your state energy office. We mentioned that we don't typically run energy efficiency programs. So um, if that's your job, then, you know, the money's flowing through the state energy office. So you do need to have that communication. Communication's key. That's, this is a big lift. So. 
And don't be afraid to communicate. Remember, they are not the PUCs, so they are not your regular. I mean, the, s several of the energy offices are arms uh, associated with the Utility Commission, but in, uh, with, with few exceptions, they are not the utility regulators. So there's not that formalistic, uh, you know, quasi-legal uh, kind of rigmarole that you have to go through when you talk to the energy office. And also, again, you know, we're, we're sort of focusing on uh, conventional utility programs and in the rebate boat program. But remember that the IRA and the IIJ are much, much larger. And from a utility perspective, think about the economic development opportunities and the, uh, the grid modernization opportunities, what's going to happen with uh, EV infrastructure build out what that'll mean to do your distribution planning and how energy efficiency and demand flexibility fits in there and the economic development of the new uh, you know, manufacturing facilities that are going in and what that means to your load and what that means to uh, you know, your systems. Great. All right, any last thoughts that you wanna get out? Good. All right, so hopefully you have all gotten something out of this session today. There's a lot of information, as we know, and if you did have a question and we weren't able to get to you, I'm sure that Frank Nola and Rodney will be happy to stick around to answer those questions. But I think you have seen today, like, it's important to leverage the infrastructure that we already have built and to communicate and to collaborate together because it's going to take us all to make this successful for our customers and um, everyone involved. So. Really appreciate all of you sitting in for this session. Again, welcome to Clear Result Energy Forum. Hope um, your other sessions go well. And just a quick reminder um, on state, oh, screen, um, I can't read that, but I think it's telling you which room to go to uh, the next round table. <laughs> um, so I believe um, one is in here and the other one is in Topaz. Um, if you need any information, we have people in the back to help you. I'll be happy to help you as well. Um, give our panelists a round of applause, please, and thank you so much for being here. All right. That's good. Thanks. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Hello. All right, so welcome to the Central and West Roundtable conversation. Before you all sit down, please don't sit down yet. We need you moving to the front. We need everyone to move to the front. I hope everybody's ready to have some fun. We've got some games that we're going to play as a team, but we need you all to move to the front to be able to divide up into teams. So those of you that are here, please, please move to the front table so we can engage you and have you be a part of the conversation. So please move forward. Move forward we're if you could. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Hopefully you all are not looking for some highbrow conversation. We're going to have really good conversation, but we've also got prizes for participation over here. So uh, we're, we're really looking for engagement. So please move forward if you could. And, uh, and get ready for some, for some fun. We'll get started probably in about 60 to 90 seconds, but please everybody move forward as far as you could. Yeah. 